Hi there folks, now as you know, when we're trading the markets, we all have our winners and losers. We have winning days and we have losing days. I, for one, have had some horrendous days in the past. Certainly when I was in the trading pits in the city of London all those years ago, I remember dropping over $120,000 in about 30 seconds on a dodgy hand signal. I still think to this day that I was right. But imagine losing close on a billion dollars. A billion dollars and then bouncing back, able to tell all about it. Well, that's exactly what the guy we're going to be interviewing today has done in the past. Now, his story has been well documented in the past, numerous books written about him, even a Hollywood film. But today we're going to hear from the man himself. We're going to hear about what got him into that situation in the first place, the important life lessons that he's learned, and what's got him to where he is today. Very interesting. I really hope you enjoy it. Come on. Good evening. Crisis talks have been going on all day at the Bank of England to work out a deal to save Britain's oldest merchant bank. Bearings is facing bankruptcy after one of its traders lost nearly £400 million on dealings in the Far East. He has now vanished. The Bank of England is racing to arrange a rescue before the Tokyo stock market opens in a few hours' time. Hi there, folks. Now, today I am super excited to have on the channel a legend of the financial markets. Now, he hardly needs any introduction at all. He's the author of two best-selling books, The Road Trader and Back from the Brink. He's an after-dinner speaker. He's also been a risk advisor for some of the major financial institutions out there. He's the subject of a very well-known film played by none other than Ewan McGregor. He's also a former football club manager. He's been on Celebrity Big Brother, and I think he came fourth. Oh yeah, he's also a former floor trader with quite a well-known British bank back in the 90s. It's none other than the rogue trader himself. It's Nick Leeson. Hi Nick, how are you doing? Very well, Andrew, how are you? I am good. I am super excited to have you on the channel today. Uh, so thanks for taking the time out of your uh, busy schedule. So what I thought I would do today is obviously you've got such a colourful um, uh, background um, in, in the past. We maybe just talk a little bit about why you are called the Road Trader. I think you nicknamed yeah. yourself, maybe. Then we'll uh, delve into a little bit about the difference between the uh, the floor trading experience, because of course we're both floor traders in the past, uh, yeah. to what we're doing now uh, on the on the screens, you know, trading electronically. So we'll compare the differences, look at the challenges that traders are facing and so forth. And then we'll talk about what you're doing now, if that's all right with you, Nick. Sure, absolutely. I, I just just one point, I suppose. I, I remember the rogue trader story. So it was, um, you know, I was in prison in Germany at the time, and um, you know, we were we were writing a book because the book was required to pay for all of my legal fees. So I think the name rogue trader originally came from the British press, uh, and they were looking for a title for the book. So, um, you know, they said everybody's referring to you as the rogue trader. So um, that's what we would like to call the book. And obviously they were paying their money. So that's why why it got called that. I don't know what else I would have called it. Well, but, I mean, uh, funny enough, because when, when I was, you know, obviously I was in the trading pits at the time and I was hmm. working for some banks and we were told not to talk to the press. Right. Um, so every time we'd come out of the exchange in the evenings or what have you, or going out for lunch, They'd always be questioning us because obviously we're sure. ways away from Singapore saying, do you know the rogue trader, the rogue trader? Do you know anything about this rogue trader? So we got to know that name, I think, maybe before the public got to know it. So they had always nicknamed it before maybe you, uh, yeah. um, you know, got famous by that name itself. So that's, that's maybe a tie out there, certainly. Um, yeah. So you're in prison in Germany as well, were you? I mean, um, yeah, I, I was arrested in Frankfurt. So, oh, that's right. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I tried, uh, you know, the, the, the first thing when I was leaving Singapore, obviously it was 23rd of February um, 1995. And, and it was really just, you know, fight or flight type of mentality. Um, I had my ex-wife with me at the, at, at the time. And, um, you know, I, I still didn't really understand what was going to go on. And, you know, the conversations that I was having were with people who worked on the floor you know, just to work out yeah. quite how bad the situation was and th then what the ramification of that was going to be. 
obviously Singapore's a tough place. Um, you know, if you, you don't want to spend time in prison, you don't want to spend time with the police officers in Singapore. So if that was going to be what befell me, I didn't want that to happen to my wife at the time. So it was really just a case of getting out of Singapore as quickly as I possibly could. Um, the plan was to meet up with one of the lads from the trading floor in Phuket at the weekend. Um, that didn't happen because the, the, the flight situation didn't work out when I was in Kuala Lumpur and then I was in constant contact with guys from the floor, to be honest with you, just trying to work because they were close to what was going on and they could see exactly what was happening. They're also robbing all the trading jackets and all the paraphernalia <laughs> that was on the floor as it was all going yeah. down as well, as you as you know would happen. Um, and then it was through them that really, you know, a couple of phone calls just really understood quite how bad it was. And then really it was just a case of, can I get back to the UK? Um, and, and that really was just what the what the thinking was. I mean, you you know, you, you are a rabbit in the headlights. You mm. have no idea what you're going to do. Um, you know, it's complete panic. And um, Frankfurt was the first place that I could get a flight back to. Um, wasn't the place of choice, but you know, that's just the way yeah. that it worked out. And and I was arrested there and spent nine months in prison in Germany. Right. Well, yeah. I, I lived in Singapore myself. Uh, after the floors sort of started to close down here in the UK, I spent, um, I think, three years working with the uh, Singapore Exchange and helping their automation and what have you. Okay. Um, due to little day trips. So I've seen Changi Prison a few times. It looked pretty grim from the outside. I should think it was pretty grim in the inside uh, 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 as well. But at least you made it back. So I guess the question for those that don't, haven't followed the story is, what got you to this stage? Why are you finding yourself in a Frankfurt prison? Um on your way back to, or on your way to Singapore for, for a four-year stint or six-year stint at the time. I think you got out for other reasons earlier, but what got yeah. you there? Well, I mean, try and enca encapsulate it in as few words as, uh, as I can, I suppose. Uh, s some fairly reckless risk-taking trades throughout a, a two-and-a-half-year period in Singapore. Found myself completely out of my debt. First time that I'd probably been in that situation since I started working in the world of finance at the age of 18. 25 when I was in Singapore. Um, certainly didn't have the skills to deal with difficult situations that I found myself in. So I found myself compounding bad decisions with even worse decisions, concealing losses. In, concealing losses, yeah. Yeah, in the now infamous 5 eights account. You know, it was something that I'd seen quite a bit at bearings. Doesn't make it mm. right by any stretch of the imagination, but it was... You know, it was fairly commonplace. I'd, I'd worked for Bearings in a couple of different locations. I'd worked in Indonesia, in Jakarta for about a year and a half. I'd worked in Hong Kong and Japan as well. Um, so, you, you know, I was quite well versed in terms of the way that Bearings was at that particular time. It wasn't particularly well run. Um, and there were flaws in the system. Now, you know, I think some of what goes on in, in terms of the way that store, the story is told is that I saw the weaknesses and then saw uh, sought to exploit them. That that's not really the case. Mm. You know, it was a case of getting myself into um, a situation where I concealed an initial error, and it really only got worse from that point. Ended up, you ended up blowing um, blowing up quite a lot of money. You said two and a half years. I, I was under the impression the actual sort of building of the position in the triple eight in the uh, five eights was of a more of a, um, a shorter time scale, or was that only was that over two and a half years? It fluctuated, to be honest with you, Andrew. So I'd say throughout the, you know, if you go back to mid-92, probably towards the end of 92, there was a loss at that stage. Managed to claw all of that back in May of 1993. Um, and then, you know, from that point, basically went home that weekend thinking, OK, I can start again. But all of the all of the you know fairly irregular practices on the trading you know i had a team of people trading for me at that time all the fillers and you know they were never reprimanded they were never rebuked if they made a mistake everything went into the five yeah. eights account so it was a it was a catch-all account for everybody yeah so on the monday morning these guys go back in one of them makes a mistake it goes back into the five eights account and and the whole st sorry story is is recreated if you know if i'd been stronger if i'd been firmer if i'd have the management skills to deal with that and you know put an end to it at that point maybe the story would have been completely yeah. different but you know from I mean, we, were, we were i mean obviously all the all the fills happen you know you hit the wrong person or you know the wrong yeah. you know whatever and you know you, you're short and you're, and you know you're hung and what have you um 
But we certainly, you know, when I was working for the major banks, you know, we we just had a policy, um, although it was maybe not um, uh, monitored as much, but we had a policy. Your first cut is the cheapest. You cut, you know, if you, if you, lose, if you lost a couple of grand on a trade, you lost a couple of grand, you take it on the chin, you maybe don't have, you know, too much of a, a celebration that night. You know, we just, we you accepted the loss and we got out of the trade. But obviously sure. it snowballs, as you know, and um, as you well know more than anyone, I would have thought. Um, Absolutely. I, I mean, I think the, you know, the key is, as you said, act early. Uh, and, and the earlier you act, and it doesn't matter, you, you know, many different w- walks of life, it's exactly the same. You know, if you've got a debt problem and you're, and, and you're trying to deal with the banks with that, you act early, you're going to get a solution far quicker than if you just ignore stuff, you don't deal with it. And that's, you know, that's just amazing. Very, very true, Nick. I mean, that's really that, interesting you say that because this isn't just about trading. That is a, I know you've got a psychology degree, but I mean, yeah. this is, you know, um, it, it's just true to all walks of life, isn't it? Just, just, just act, get, act, act early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, you know, you see so many episodes in the world of finance where if people had acted earlier, and dealt with the situation, brought it to somebody's attention, the story would have been very, very different. Yeah. But it is true in absolutely everything. You know, health, you know, the sooner you act, the well, better the outcome. You know, debt, finance, all of those sort of things. If, you, if you're having issues and you're struggling, you know, it's far easier if you act early. And, you know, hopefully that would have longer or, 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 or more deeper yeah. Uh, or more beneficial outcomes for mental health and things like that, the, the, you know, the earlier people act. So, you know, I, something I endorse and try to impart on my children all of the time, you know, there might be a bit of punishment or a bit of negativity around it, mm. but it is going to have a better outcome. Well, that's important. I mean, you, you've, 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 you've covered this book, haven't you, Back from the Bridge? I presume that you, you sort of cover this type of thing in that, in that. is that right? Yeah, a bit. I, I think, you know, there's always different ways of looking lo- looking at things. So, you know, the collapse of the bank was 95. I was released in 99. And, and one of the one of the one of the things that I find really good about after dinner speaking and talking at, at various conferences and so on is you get asked different questions and there's people who have different approaches to things all of the time. And, it, and you're always constantly thinking, you know, I remember once I was at, at an event in South Africa uh, um, a very academic event, uh, and, and one person asked me, you know, why was my ethical compass so narrow? And, you know, I'd never really thought about, you know, things that were going on during that time in Singapore. And, it, you know, your actions or my actions were going to have implications for other people. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, I, I didn't consider that. It was yeah. really, you know, you were laser focused on trying to correct the situation. That's what I think it is. And again, that happens again in, in walks of life. You see the mm-hmm. Ponzi schemes now that are crashing and the pension funds going up the wall. And maybe people are not thinking about necessarily... You know the family that's putting food on the table, that's relying yeah. on the pension, that's relying on that job, and you know it's it's very easy to get, I think, um, caught up in that. And I'm not sort of here to defend you, but at 25 years old, with little really um, sort of education in that, you know, with all the sort of trappings of, you know, of what the, you know the lifestyle is bringing, it's sometimes difficult to see that the wood for the trees. Yeah, and abs- look, I think I think we're learning all the time. You, you know, no nobody has all of the information at the beginning of their of their life's journey you know we do learn all of the time and we approach things in different ways so you know some of the things might not have been what i wrote about in the book at that time they might have you know not not necessarily occurred to me but it'd be a different way that i you know i I appraise things that have happened since that 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 particular time so would you say then the whole experience which was obviously dreadful for you and your family at the time and and all the people that had repercussions too would you say that has had a profound effect on your life going forward um in the last say even you know that's 95 now that's 25 years ago you know in the last say 10 years like, is it still something that apart from the things that have come from it the speakers and all that has it actually had an effect on your life and thinking yeah look absolutely i think we're all the sum of all of our experiences right so the good ones and the bad ones and it's just about how you use them mm. You know, some people might just want to avoid them and keep them in the past and not deal with them. And and you see that certainly with some of the other road traders that have uh, have come to the fore since there. You know, people still blaming the banks and uh, and trying to deny some of the stuff that happened. But you know, I think in anything that you do, and, and again, this goes across all walks of life, is you you have to accept responsibility. You have to be accountable. Mm. And if you can if you can work through those two processes, then everything is easier, mm. right? Because you're being truthful with yourself. 
uh, and those closest and dearest to you. If you, you know, if you're lying, and and obviously this was a tissue of lies over a over a number of years whilst I was in Singapore. Um, that you're trying to support all of these things, it just it, it gets the better mm. of you, better of you in the in in the long run. So. Um, well, yeah, I think self admission is a big thing, and you know, I know you had a near life experience with uh, with uh, with cancer back when all this was going on as well. I'm yeah. sure that changes you as well, um, you know. And uh, you're looking back and thinking, well, all I can do is learn from that. So, and to be honest, you know, I, you know we've only sort of just um, touched base after all these years, um, you know. And I've sort of followed your story to a certain extent. I think you've been true to that regard. You put your hands up, you know, um, yeah. and you haven't been casting blame. There's people there that still will cast blame. And there's still people that are trading today that are casting blame when the market goes against them about, you know, <laughs> stop hunter. Well, loads of things, casting blame on others when sure. sometimes you should just put your hands up and said, my mistake and I am going to move on and I'm going to learn from that. And and uh, hopefully people will benefit from uh, my mistakes going forward and not be, um, you know, not be too, you know, uh, too much of a casualty because of them. So I, and I, and I think you've done that to, to a very, um, to a very high you know, uh, level. You know, you're know, back trading again, a bunch of all the other things you're doing, the speakers, I think you were working, working with or writing for the FT a couple of weeks ago, so you couldn't make the meeting or something like that. So you're doing lots of things, but you're also trading now, aren't you? I am, yeah. It's, um, you know, trading was something that I always loved. Um, I might not have been particularly good at it for a period of time back in back in Singapore, Different though, wasn't it? But it, it was, yeah. But it's it, but it's always it, you know it's exciting. Um, you, you know, it gets the juices flowing yeah. definitely, and um, you know it's difficult to put it down and leave it behind. So I've always you know I've always maintained an interest, and in, you know wh- wh- whether it's me trading my pension portfolio or it's me day trading yeah. trading with some. Uh, some fairly volatile CFDs. It, it, it's part of the part of the makeup, to be honest with you. So it's, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday out in the states um, that we're doing an event with at the end of the month, actually, you and I. And um, uh, he was a great chat. We're talking about, you know, once you're a trader, you're always a trader. It's always in your blood. You know, yeah. whether you know whether you're, you know sitting there in the evenings and you know, CNN comes on, you're talking about the stock market, and you're looking, you you can't get it out of your system. And um, yeah, I me, think. I- Gone. No, for me, I mean, it's never been out of my system. We, in fact, for people that are listening, Nick and I were born one day apart back in back all those years ago. So we are basically been on a 55 year journey almost by one day. Um, both gone down different paths of trading and now sure. back here sort of all these years later uh, to talk about it. But yeah, once you are a trader, I don't think it leaves you. So um, and, and you're back into trading again. You're looking at CFDs. Are you, are you trading? Um, uh, Forex more? Or, uh, what, what are you? Actually? No, I no. I, look, I, I I think you know. And both of us will agree this, and I'm sure other traders will as well. If you were, if you want to make money trading the markets, you need a certain amount of volatility. So I'm drawn towards the volatility. I don't want to be looking at my screen all day, um, trying to look for the markets that are moving the most. I um, you know, I know that the DAX and the Dow are reasonably volatile add gold into that situation and that's all i trade okay. you know, so, I, so i just want to try and be as good and effective as as i can be with those currencies you know it isn't something that i used to do it's not something that i'm used to and uh yeah, good. adding another product is is not an ambition of mine i um yeah know what you know i mean absolutely. talk about volatility um are you embarking on crypto stuff at all at the moment? No. I mean, I know we're a bit old for all this stuff, Nick, but I mean, uh... <laughs> I, I definitely am, right? I don't understand it. I um, I don't have any ambition or desire to understand it. It's, yeah. you, know, you know, when I look at the crypto markets and people talk to me about Bitcoin, you know, where, where do you buy Bitcoin? The, the, the only thing I can see when I'm looking at it is it needs to fall 50 to 80% from a peak. And then maybe you buy, you know. Well, but I've got uh, some on here, but, but I bought a little bit there. But I oh, mean, did you? Yeah, it's a little nano. It's a little um, digital wallet, apparently. Well, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, if you if you can't feel it and use it to pay for stuff, I find it quite difficult. Yeah. So I mean, obviously the crypto. The reason why I mentioned it is because obviously it's a volatile market with all these little ones coming in, all the all the ICOs. Too too too, too volatile, Andrew. Yeah, too volatile. You know, even for my blood. So when you came, I mean, obviously the floor that we, you know, standing in the trading pits, I was an independent for a while, worked for, actually worked for Lehman Brothers for a while, but I had nothing to do with that one, by the way. Um, but, um, so when we were in the trading pits, it was very different, wasn't it? The whole different feel. You hear people buying, 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 selling. You get a feel for where the markets are going. Screens are very different. 
how did you find the transition from um the uh you know from the pits to the to the to the trading screens where we are now was it a complete re-education yeah i think so i think you um you know and i've heard that from so many different people and a lot of people didn't manage to make that move either and i'm sure you know a, yeah, a number of a number of people who didn't i think what i you know what i try to do at, at this particular point is simplify it as much as i can so you know the areas of the day that i'm looking at and i look at them closely are, are the opening bell so okay. the opening bell in europe the opening bell uh new york and, and and you know and i know that the market will move around that particular period so that's one of the conditions that i need i want a market that's moved i don't want to be sat there all day of course, yeah. try, looking at technical indicators trying to work out you know when the market is going to move you know is it 10 o'clock yeah, it just does. You know, that's not for me anymore. You know, as you've as you've already mentioned, and uh, I'm sure we both look it. I'm 54, and and that's not for me. You know, I don't want to be in front of the screen so long. So just really focus on that opening bell period. You're going to get lots lots of market opening orders. I think it's a little bit more forgiving in in, in my um, in my experience. Yeah, and and I think you can see a little bit more. In, in terms of how that relates back to a floor trading market, because you, you, you're getting a lot of um, you're, you're getting a lot of price action in that period. Yeah, you're and right. It, and, it's, and it's two-way price action, mm. right? You know, every now and again, you might there might be a trend that immediately mm. takes off, but you get a lot of two-way price action in that. Are you right, Andy? I've never really thought about that in comparison to the floor, because obviously, when the bell went at sort of well, the Bunds used to open at seven in the morning in London, you know. The first five minutes, because obviously all the overnight positions are coming in from every first five minutes, that's when you normally have you know the moves and the aggregate moves, you know, taking where you went. And that was, and obviously, you know, 20 minutes in, it was sort of like settled down. Yeah. Um, I never really looked at that comparison in my trading, but I think that's very, very right. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, if it works for you, that's brilliant. So you're sort of like, um, are you using technical analysis or are you using any talk forms of technical analysis? I mean, I think one of the reasons why I credit my sort of uh, screen success, uh, if you like, is that, you know, I just look at hand signals, you know, um, I was basic. Now, um, you know, with all these technical indicators, I don't use them so much myself. Are you a big fan of them or not? No, no. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of guys that have gone from the floor who, you know, make a living out of their technical analysis now. And, you know, they've really, they've really embraced that side of it. For me, you know, it, it has... As I said at the beginning, I try to simplify things as much as I can. So, you know, I'll look at where I think the support and resistance are. I'll look at the moving averages. From time to time, I might have a look at the RSI, but that's really it, mm. right? I, I, I don't want to, you know, sometimes I do, um, I do some mentoring with guys who are trading and all of a sudden they'll show me, you know, we might be doing the mentoring session and they'll show me their screens. And I'm like, whoa, what's Spaghetti. going on here? Uh -oh, yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And, you know, it's cut into so many different shapes and there's so many different things going on. I don't even see the price. <laughs> no, I don't know what you're doing. So, yeah. and, and um, so for me, it's more, um, and, you, and you know this as well, you know, it's about how you deal with managing a position. I think yeah. you can, you know, everybody wants to trade and everybody wants to trade profitably. I think half of the battle is being able to manage a position especially a losing position and then controlling the emotional side of things because you know it's very easy for the blood to raise you know to trade angry and you're going to lose a lot of money if you get into those situations yeah. so that's kind of what i try to so, help Nick, people I mean, with more uh, this is maybe a bit of a odd, well, not odd question but with your experience do you use stops now do you put stops in to protect or do you think you can control because some people can i find myself better trading with stops do yeah. you um manage stops there or do you manage it do you place the stops in when you place the trade now with your maybe yeah being entirely honest um that they don't go in at the trade entry okay right but they'll go in fairly soon after if the market starts to go away from me you know i i think if i if i'm going to look at negatives for uh, things that i do i will allow trades to run a little bit further okay. um the, the, I like the, the honesty then maybe i should yeah. Um, or, or maybe would be, uh, you know, would be something that would be more taught. Um, so I tend to let, but I, but I'm I'm well able to trigger a stop now. Yeah. Um, I think the problem years ago when I was working with bearings um, in, in Singapore is I had a position you couldn't stop out. 
you know i think it well like over a period of time i think if you go if you go to um if you go forward to february of 1995 or even the end of 1994 i think i was long 60,000 futures i had 100,000 options positions you know like i i don't know where you put the stop but that's yeah. going <laughs> to you know like with with a bit of front running as well in front yeah. of that you're going to that market's going to zero yeah. um if you try to unwind that position so well bearings did didn't they well, they did. Unfortunately, <laughs> they went to they went to a pound. I think if we're if we're being factually correct, yeah, it is the emotions uh, in both scenarios: making money and losing money. It's it's the it's the emotional unhinged trader that ends up, I think, sort of you know uh, blowing up the account. I mean, and as I say, it comes with the success, winning trades and losing trades. Um, mm. But do you think then would it, would it be fair to say? Look, you and I have both been in the markets. We've seen a lot go through. We've seen a lot of money go through our hands, in and out. Um, would you say for the aspiring trader, the new trader coming in, because you know, a lot of people sort of will be watching us today are thinking about getting into trading. Yeah. Would you say for them that they should be using more rigid risk control on their trades because they may be not having haven't experienced the, the the emotional swings that they should use? Yeah, I, I look, absolutely. You need the more rigid controls because that's the thing that's going to keep you safe. You know, over time, once you become a bit more used to it, I think, yeah. you know, I think experience has a, you know, and obviously with our age, we're slightly more experienced, but experience has a huge part to play in this. You know, you've got to desensitize yourself a little bit to some of those fluctuations you're going to see in the market. And, you know, we've had the benefit of seeing that, the good, mm. the bad, the indifferent, um, and, and it is about fine tuning what you do. Like, I think it's a fantastic, fascinating and fantastic market for people to get, get to want to get involved in and aspire to be successful in. Um, but it's also very dangerous if you, if you don't have the right tools at your disposal, especially in the beginning. You know, what, what happens if you miss size a trade? You know, understanding about how your risk is changing as the position is unfolding and as you're adding to it or or detracting from it and you know we, we spoke off air about some of the correlations that exist as well and uh, yeah and unfortunately it does attract the you know the inherent gambler as well to a certain extent because money is emotional and you know here in i know you're in ireland but um you know, any of the sport you watch i don't know if you watch all the sporting events but any sporting event this day it's got all the gambling sites advertised around it's all gambling getting people and that has drawn a few people to our markets and we know what happens to gamblers ultimately um you know unless you know really what you're doing the, the gamblers end up you know donating um you know, it might be a bit of fun but you know you can donate a lot to these markets unless you do manage your um well, expectations risk and as you say so i think that's really you know, really wise advice, and that's from someone, folks, that's basically been, you know, been there to see it all from from those days. So, if you were to say um, one bit of advice to an aspiring trader, Nick, um, what would you say? Someone that's listening in today, they thought about it, they heard someone doing it. What would you say would be your sort of major bit of advice? Well, there's probably a few things, Andrew, and again, I think they they ring true in any walk of life. It's not um, it's not necessarily um, just a, a financial or trading type of environment. You, you know, they always ask for help and advice. Um, you know, I think there are avenues, um, be that something on. Um, I think when it comes to trading, I think the thing, there's a couple of things that I really hate about it in terms of the way that it is promoted to the retail traders um, that are out there. One is the way that it's marketed, um, which is just abominable, really. Um, you know, people with the pictures of the fast cars and the, you know, the, the, the trappings of wealth that, yeah. they, that probably don't exist. Uh, and um, and I forgot what the second one was going to be there, but the uh, I'll probably come back yeah. to the second part of it. Um, but equally so, it's um, you, you know, so always ask for help and advice. Yeah. You know, so I, I mean, and um, obviously we're experienced. My view. when you transitioned from back onto the screens, did you sort of take any um, formal education, or did you just use your past experiences in the markets? And no, I just I just used past um, uh, past experience. To be honest with yeah. you, I think the problem uh, the problem with yeah. the yeah the problem with the formal education, and that's not something that necessarily I would recommend. And you've probably got more experience of this than me. I think the problem with some of the formal education that exists out there is that some of it that's really really bad. 
Um, there's some of it that's distinctly average, and I'm not sure how much of it is that good. Yeah. And, you know, the way I look at education, to be honest with it, specifically from a trading perspective, is that they have to come up with a formula that works. Mm -hmm. so, so people are looking for hard, rigid rules. Financial markets don't react that way all of the time. You know, if somebody's got a big trade, it's going to move in that direction, regardless of what UI or technicals think. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, you know, how do you find that right or, or the most appropriate type of education? I think learning on the job is part of it. I think, you know, I, I think one of the fa fascinating developments, and we spoke about this and we're both appearing on, on, on this program in, in a couple of weeks, um, you know, seeing things in real time, people looking at traders, Doing stuff live, I think, is one of the most beneficial things that you can see. Um, so I use Telegram to show people the the bias that I'm developing during the day, um, why I trade when I trade, and the decisions that I've made. Um, if there are losing trades, there are losing trades. I can't do anything about it. It's it, it's in real time. So it just it, it helps develop the, the the emotional side of it and the um, and the psychological side of it. In, uh, and there's always a lot of interaction as well around it. Okay, in so it's an interactive people. Telegram group that you run. Um, yeah. Which is it's brilliant because, you know, as you know, trading pits, trading screens, here on your own, things can happen that, you know, and it's lonely business on your own. It's good to be in that like community. Yeah. And so you offer that community um, and you've got... Um, uh, you've got a little, uh, you've got a company set up where people can basically come and join you on that should they wish to. Yeah, the company's called bullandbearcap.com. Okay, so bullandbearcap. Been... I'll, what I'll do, I'll put up um, a thing on the screen here and also put a link in below so anyone that wants to go over and uh, join Nick, see what it's all about, can do so. You're doing quite well, I understand, by what we uh, what I looked at. Yeah, it moves around, as you know. Um, I'm on a good run at the moment. I hate to, I hate to jinx it too much. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the, the, the unfortunate thing about good runs is that we know they come to an end. Yeah. So the... Um, but it's, but it's yeah. knowing when to, you know, it's knowing, you no know, one knows when the end of the trend is, but no. you can get sort of experience of, you know, think, hang on, this is not looking right. I'm going to yeah. ease back or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm, my, my trading is slightly a bit, uh, is definitely a little bit contrarian. So it, um, you know, if I, if, if I hit a strong trend, um, it tends to damage me. Okay. Um, but, you know, when we're trading in a range, I, I, I do particularly well. So the ranges, I know the ranges have been moving around a little bit just mm -hmm. lately, but we tend to be, you know, 33, 33 and a half in the, the Dow is, has always been well supported over the last, um, the last couple of months. 35 tends to be the ceiling, maybe just above that. So as long as we stay within that range, I do quite well within that. So someone that wants to join you, they can come into your site, they, they click the link, that will take them through to like a um, a page where they can uh, yeah. register. Um, do you offer trials or anything like that? Or You're asking the least technical person who, uh, about your team you know. <laughs> about, about the business. Yeah, no, I, no, we don't uh, we don't do trials. Um, there's, uh, but at the same time, there's no contracts. So, no contracts. Yeah. So they can get so, out of so, it like where they see Yeah, it. absolutely. If they don't like it, um, you know, we do do offers from time to time, um, but they, you know, if they don't like it, they just cancel it straight away. And, it, and you're interacting with the members as well if they want to touch base with you and say, hey, yeah, this, they, 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 there's two types to be honest with you we do a live uh, so we do so we do a, a one-way telegram session uh, which is the basic uh, format and then there is one-to-one -one as well um, rather than community so much um, we do do live sessions every friday and um, so um, we, we do a, do a poll during the week to see when people want to to view some trading be it non-farm payroll or, or something else that's happening during the week um, and then we do a live session for about 20, 25 minutes. And that's showing that. the charts as well and looking at yeah. levels and things that you're yeah. thinking about and what have you. Yeah, but it's specifically designed to that period. So is it the non-farm payroll number? Is it the opening bell? So yeah. 20 minutes around that, I take a trade um, and, and, and we can see the, you know, the trade develop over that particular period. And, you know, more often than not, I will close it within that period as well. Okay, great. Well, I think that sounds very exciting and I'm sure... There's going to be a lot of people that are going to uh, want to see what you've got there because it does sound, um, you know, certainly with your experience of the goods and the bads and now hopefully the, uh, you know, bit more controlled, um, you know, it's going to be great for the for the members to explore that. Nick, I think this has been absolutely fascinating. Fascinating for me, 
sharing a bit of the um, you know, floor to screen experience. Fascinating to hear your story from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I know there's lots written about you and so forth. Some of it true, some of it, as you say, indifferent, some of it plain flat wrong. So it's good to be able to sort of share that, your side of it, um, you know, for the audience today. So I really do appreciate you coming on, sharing your uh, time with us today. And I'm sure the audience are going to absolutely love it as well. Um, so thanks for coming on, Nick. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, I hope you found that useful. I sure really enjoyed talking to Nick there. Now, if you want to follow Nick, you can do so. Hit the link in the description tab below. It will take you to where you need to go. Hope you enjoyed the video. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs down as well. Let me know what you think. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you don't already do so and hit that bell notification. Notifies you when the next video has been released. Also, don't forget, we are streaming live around the clock up to six times a day. If you want to take part in that, you can do so. Come over to forexsignals.com website, take out a free trial. That's not your thing. That's not a problem. I'll see you next week. Have a good week.